I have a third component of materials, a third part of my collection, which is devoted to the study of childhood. And um, this is quite unique. This, uh, this is unique component because uh, after my years in the uh, Soviet Union, where my husband was the ambassador, to Mo uh, ambassador in Moscow, um, I wrote a book called Children of Glasnost, which was about childhood in uh, the Soviet Union, but also Russian childhood. And it was largely devoted to the cultural shaping of, of children and how they grow up in certain kinds of circumstances. And as a Foreign Service family, I've always been interested in how culture shapes children. We all learn to speak. The universalities of child development are there. Every child learns to speak, except a few who are disabled for one reason or another. But they all speak different languages. It depends on the culture in which they grow up. So the child who grows up to speak Japanese is not the same as the child who speaks up to grow English and then speak English. And then the effect um, of language itself interactive with children and child development. And each language has its own spirit and its own. So the, I'm interested in Aboriginal languages uh, um, and so on. So that the collection that I have of on Russian childhood and um, uh, child development in the Soviet Union is actually unique. It's um, uh, I was able because I had just been the vice chair of the Canadian Commission for the Year of the Child, and we went to Moscow, and <clears throat> so I, the Soviets were less resistant to my efforts to interview and visit people than they might have been otherwise. This gave them some. They gave me some. Otherwise, the wife of an ambassador is not considered exactly welcome, but this in this case they felt that I had earned my spurs, so to speak, and uh, it was a very rich experience. Uh, at that time there was an enormous um, uh, uh, richness in Russian childhood, uh, which used then to be sort of clamped down by about 15 when, they, when the state apparatus came into play. But the book I wrote, which was about the period where they had this good start, and then it was open at 15, was remarkable. We went there in 1980, and uh, the book was published in 1990. I went back and saw the same children I'd seen arriving at school in 1980 at the school right across from the residence. Uh, uh, I saw them and interviewed them in 1990. And, uh, or 1989 actually, and, and saw the difference that had happened in this extraordinary generation of children growing up. So I have, I uh, was able to collect a lot of materials that are both in uh, English and in Russian. Um, I'm not myself a Russian speaker, but I've had able assistance with uh, uh, Russian speakers and with translators and so on, and some of that material is unique. Um, it has been uh, uh, some of it turns up on Amazon for uh, because their copies were things were printed in perhaps 200 copies or 300 copies from the research institutes and so on on children and childhood. Uh, but Russia was not my only interest in um, uh, cultural or childhood. The groups of children in different uh, cultures. When we were in India, I worked with uh, the children of nomadic construction workers, and I became very interested. And I have materials related to childhood in India and in the very, that very complex and fascinating country. We were in Latin America, so I have a lot of interest in Latin American children growing up in Latin America and materials related to that. Um, and those materials are either separately uh, placed in, the, in, the, uh, in my center or they can be they're placed among the other materials that are, um, that are in the first, the second component of, my, uh, of the collection. And can be found on the um, on the uh, word searchable database. So that in India, for example, uh, I had a lot of material on child labor in India, the sexual exploitation of children in India, working children, um, uh, and so on. But they're more spread out with the articles on child labor or children in armed conflict or children in exploitation, um, and and that and children in poverty. There's a lot about that. So. These are materials that um, uh, are very interesting <clears throat> uh, for internationally, but uh, domestically, uh, 
and fairly recently in my life. I mean, not until really I went to the Senate and became involved with uh, the Aboriginal People's Committee did I, under did I develop this passion and interest in, in the culture of Aboriginal peoples in Canada. And I mean, I was interested in, in Indigenous peoples in, for example, in the Soviet Union, where there is also a component of Aboriginal peoples. And I did, in my book, compare actually ever, the um, little peoples, as the uh, Soviets called them, of the North with Canadian uh, Aboriginal culture. So I was learning, and learning painfully, uh, I think, about how uh, children, Aboriginal children, have grown up or and been impacted by uh, colonization as a foreign service. In the Canadian Foreign Service, I never thought of Canada as a colonizing country until I began to look at the issues around Aboriginal children, the residential schools and all that kind of thing. So I have uh, a very large collection actually of materials on Aboriginal uh, children and youth, uh, not only in Canada, but also from Australia, New Zealand and and uh, the United States and other places where um, Indigenous children uh, have been suffering from the various kinds of difficulties that they have over the historical interaction with other cultures. Uh, so I feel that the, the that particular section uh, or that particular interest segment of my collection is also rich and available for further study. Um, I continue to work on Aboriginal um, children and youth issues um, and um, to look at it from a human rights perspective in particular and uh, to uh, travel to, to remote communities to meet with young people as well as with the elders and find out about their childhood. And I produced a book on, on, uh, on that with one of my colleagues and um, so I think that, that that's child, I mean it's it's always a rights-based perspective to some extent because uh, that's the framework that I use, but it's really looking at a whole variety of components of, uh, of childhood and the study of childhood. Um, so the final sort of addition uh, components, which I haven't mentioned actually, because it's not only papers and documents I have, but I also have uh, books and uh, DVDs and um, VHS, you know, nobody uses them anymore, but I don't want to throw them out because some of them are important documents from an archival point of view. Um, and those also have all been cataloged. And I have a material, a collection of materials related to women, uh, particularly women in Russia, but the understanding of the interaction, which is very important for me, uh, between women's lives and children's lives, women's rights and children's rights. Um, and uh, that collection also has, has that distinctive characteristic that these are um, uh, materials that I've collected from that perspective. Uh, so the, the collection is um, continuing to grow. Government departments are continuing to close. I'm continuing to acquire more, <laughs> more from them, but also from many other sources. Uh, we have developed within the center a, uh, a network of child rights academics from across the country and also from England and other uh, connections. Uh, I collected um, and continued to collect um, information from every contact that I can, I can. So I see this as a living collection. It's both historical um, uh, and a living collection. And uh, I'm proud that Carlton has uh, uh, given me the space in which to live with my collection and to develop all the activities that are associated with it. And I'm hoping that more and more people will come to use the, uh, use the collection and understand the uh, unique quality that it has and come themselves to uh, recognize the value of this child rights perspective.